Well, I did grow up in Corpus Christi, the child of immigrant Germans who escaped the Nazis. And that's kind of an interesting story in itself, how they got to Corpus Christi. But I graduated from <clears throat> Roy Miller High School and then went on to Texas Women's University and got a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And all of my clinical work was done at Parkland. So I was at, on the Denton campus for a year and a summer, and then the rest of the years and summers until the last half of my senior year at TWU, I was at Parkland and did all of my clinical rotations there. And then I went back to Denton and graduated with the girls I had started with in 19... 6058. So I was working in the emergency room at Parkland and um, had taught, actually had taught a couple of summer semesters at the school college of nursing. Didn't like that, which is kind of interesting to see how my life has turned out in academia. But uh, I was at the pool one day in um, at my apartment complex and I met these two young ladies from Louisiana and they were school teachers but they had left that career and they were now flying for American Airlines. And they said, oh, this company loves nurses, you should apply. So I did, much to the horror of my mother, and I was accepted and uh, in December of 62, C.R. Smith himself pinned my wings on me and I went on to fly out of the Dallas Love Field base for a year and uh, then they sent me out to what was then called the Stewardess College, and I was in charge of emergency training for all of the ladies. At that time, it was just women who came through there. And after that, I uh, married Gordon, and we moved to Fort Worth, and I began working at what's now called Baylor All Saints. At the time, it was All Saints Episcopal Hospital. Now, how did you and Gordon enter one, one another's lives? I was working and living and having a good time in Dallas, and I met a guy named Mort Meyerson, also <clears throat> the namesake for the now well-known, well-regarded Meyerson Symphony Hall. And Mort uh, and I had mutual friends, and he thought it was pretty funny that there was a nice Jewish girl who was not only a nurse but a stewardess, and he dared Gordon to take me out. Gordon at that time had finished UT, undergraduate, Harvard Law School, and was working as an assistant attorney general in Austin. And he told Gordon about me, and Gordon said, no Jewish mother would allow her daughter to be a nurse and a stewardess. And Moore said, she did, and she is, and she will eat your lunch. <laughs> and we, so that he set up a blind date for us, and that was the beginning of the end of Gordon's happy life. <laughs> You moved to Fort Worth in 1964, yes. I read, and that was one year before the foundation of Tarrant County Junior College. How much did you know about junior colleges? Were you aware that there was oh, one coming? A junior college, yes. absolutely, because in Corpus Christi, we had Del Mar College, which was well regarded and well attended. And in fact, both my brothers went to school there. So the, the um, idea of a junior college was very familiar to me. So it was interesting to realized that my new home didn't have one of those. And I followed it closely and was very pleased when the town hall meetings endorsed it and the voters endorsed it. Did either you or Gordon have anything to do in, in the election? Not that I recall other than voting for it. So um, the next year, uh, Tarrant County College, Tarrant County Junior College was founded. Now you took some non-credit courses back there after it was opened, I believe prior to your coming on the board? I don't think so. No. Oh. But what's interesting is Gordon at that time was officing at the Fort Worth Club, and that's where the college had their offices. And so he met Dr. Rushing, I met Dr. Rushing. So we felt like we were akin in some way, but my children took courses at um, TCJC while they were at UT. And uh, I remember them coming home and telling me, don't let anybody tell you that that junior college is a nothing. They were impressed with the academics and the curriculum and the professors. When were you first approached about being on the board of trustees and how did that all come about? Well, interestingly, Dr. Rushing and I recently had a um, 
conversation on email and by telephone. I was trying to set up a time to take Dr. Giovannini down to spend some time with him because he had never really met him and uh, gotten to know him. And um, in my initial conversation with him, I knew that I was not going to run again, but I didn't have the nerve to tell him. <laughs> so I wrote him a long letter and told him how much I had enjoyed my time on the college board. And he wrote back and, and said, how coincidental, he said my swimming pool, he is now retired in Lampasas and on the ranch, and, but he swims every day. And he said he and his swim buddies had just celebrated his 30th anniversary with them. And he told me in this letter uh, or email that he, they knew Dr. Owen probably wouldn't run again. And they were really trying to convince her to step down so they could appoint someone and avoid the election commotion. And of course she refused, as was her style. I am not backing down or quitting under any circumstances. She was 96, I think, at the time. And it's a six year term. So they decided they would, I guess Dr. Rushing and some of the board members would look around to see who might suit to take to run for her chair. And I wasn't, I had to go back and look at my resume because he said he came to the Will Rogers Auditorium where I was conducting a meeting. And the only thing I can figure out is that it was at some sort of a town hall meeting and I'm not even sure what the issues were. It had to be either billboards or <laughs> landscaping or some, we were doing some long range planning for Fort Worth at the time and I was chair of that committee. And he sat at the back of the auditorium just to observe what people were saying. And he watched me preside over this meeting. And he went back and told um, his board members, I think I found the person who might be a good candidate to run for Dr. Owen's seat, which really touched me and also made me realize how you never know who's watching or listening to you or getting an impression of you and how important it is to get it right or at least give it your best shot. That's how I used to uh, terrorize my children. Be careful what you say and do. There's someone that knows me who's listening. <laughs> so someone, and I, I was trying to remember who approached me. I don't think it was Dr. Rushing. It may have been one of the board members. And um, Gordon and I talked about it. And um, I remember he said, you don't ever want to get into politics. And I said, oh, this isn't politics. This is the junior college. He said, it's an election. And I said, well, um, they said it, it, no one else would file. Well, three other people filed and I got into a runoff and I lost a lot of weight worrying about it. And I remember sitting across the table from Gordon at a restaurant one night and he said, well, how do you like politics? <laughs> so somehow I pulled it off. I won the seat and I've always been very aware, conscious of the fact that it was Dr. May's seat. I knew her, of course, at the hospital and everyone almost genuflected when she came out of her lab <laughs> the few times she would emerge. And there was a lot of respect for her. You were well known at the time for all of your civic activity. Yeah. You just mentioned chairing a, a, a board of some kind. But then you were in elective office and it's sort of a different ball game. Very much just, so. What about that transition? Well, you, you learn quickly there are a lot of rules. The policy manual is about that big. Um, bringing it back here this week so as soon as I have a bag big enough to carry it. And that um, transparency and, and um, being sure that you not only follow the local policy, but their state rules and their federal rules and uh, being accountable, very accountable for everything you do. Not that being on a nonprofit board doesn't require that too, but there's just a different overlay, if you will, of accountability when you're in a public office. The first big thing to come before the board after you joined was the replacement of Joe Rushing. And I remember that uh, the board didn't seem to look outside or anything. They named C.A. Robertson, the new chancellor elect. But I remember that Pete Zapata sort of said something, you know, maybe we should have at least taken a look outside. <laughs> of course, you were just a baby on the board. Mm -hmm. You'd been on the board three or four months. Yeah. What was your take on all that? Did you th think it maybe was a little hasty? Probably, I probably wasn't sure of how all that should work. And I had been involved with some headhunting, some executive search um, at uh, my synagogue and at uh, Trinity Valley School and 
um, maybe even Easter seal where I was on the board. So, but when you're in a public institution like this, and certainly all of the searches since, um, just like when you're bidding on products or uh, vendors, you need to open it up. And probably we should have. CA was an easy choice. He was uh, in on everything. It had been Dr. Rushing's right-hand man. It was just a really, really, really easy transition. And I think that's what the board was looking for is, is less a fuss and muss as they could have. The other thing I remember, and that's interesting that you said that was the first big one. What I remember is the uh, student newspaper was on every single campus. And I think maybe even Dr. Rushing wanted it moved to one campus and the brouhaha that arose over that, which over time I think has proven to be the right decision. But at the time, the students didn't like it. The faculty advisors didn't like it. And I thought, what have I stepped into? <laughs> They're getting into this big fight over moving this student newspaper to one campus. Three years before you came on the board, the college had acquired uh, or was in the process of acquiring land for a new campus, the one that was to be in Arlington that uh, turned out to be the Southeast campus. They looked all over the place. They finally selected the site and they paid for the campus. And then there was, uh, we were going to construct it. And there were all kinds of problems. But the first thing, there was a groundbreaking in December of, I think, 1994. Maybe, maybe 93. Do you, what do you remember about that groundbreaking? Because I remember it very well. You're going to have to help me remember. It was at the little <laughs> cabin, the, the little cabin out by yes, the pond. Yes, that Judith Carey and I worked for years after to save and make it into a student center or faculty lounge or something. What, remind me, was the weather bad in December? Icy, cold, wet? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All of the above. And we had had to cancel twice because of bad weather. Oh, <laughs> and so we finally uh, got together, uh, ran outside. You guys spaded a little dirt, and then we ran, back, ran in <laughs> back inside into the warmth and the hot chocolate. <laughs> right. But as I said, the construction of the Southeast Campus, there were a lot of problems uh, associated with that. And there was ultimately legal action and everything. So what was the board's feeling about all of that? Because that was a very tense time. It was. We, I, I remember when we approved the contract with the Thomas S. Byrne Company, uh, Mr. Patterson and Tommy Seymour were sitting in the front row. And I kiddingly said to them, well, I hope you guys get it right. You, you've not been in business very long. And of course, that was a blatant lie. They'd been in business forever and had done other work for us and were well known and well regarded in the community. And I, shortly after that, just a matter of months, they sold the company to someone new. And I assumed things would go on as they should, but we did run into some issues, um, either plumbing or electricity at the end. We ended up in a lawsuit and uh, it was not pretty how it ended. And Tom Law, the attorney for us forever, tried to, um, right into another contract, or I guess the settlement of the lawsuit, that this particular construction company would never again darken our doors. <laughs> but he did it nicely. <laughs> One of the big changes in the early 90s was the move from running at large to running in yes. sing single member districts. Yes. What was the feeling uh, on you and the board about that change? Was we, there some resistance? Yeah. Oh, yes. We went to Austin several times. Garfield Thompson, who was our representative at the time, and his aide was, and I'm blanking out on his name, he's now, he went on and became the representative and now has a private law practice in Fort Worth. The issue was they, they wanted to be sure that the board always represented all of the diverse uh, racial and neighborhood uh, entities in Tarrant County. And we went down two sessions and, and said, we do, we are, we, you know, we've always been that way and we always will be well. The answer was, well, we're going to make sure of that. So it didn't pass the first session. The second session it did, and we went into single-member districts. And so then it became incumbent upon the board members to appoint someone to look at their areas of where they lived and what they represented and to draw the lines so that the single-member districts would exist. 
and I uh, asked a young lawyer in Gordon's law firm to represent me. And when it was all over, he came and he said, Mrs. Appleman, please don't ask me to do anything like that again. It was really difficult. And I'm not sure we ever carved out a truly all minority district. Uh, but we, you know, we have uh, the north side and the southeast side. In fact, I just learned with this election coming up that my district skirts the east side of Arlington Lake, Lake Arlington. And um, sure enough, we have someone running from there who lives in an apartment on the east side of Lake Arlington. When C.A. Robertson announced his retirement, the board this time did choose to go outside and looked and brought in, I think, six semifinalists. But Irma Johnson was not on that list, and that caused lots of angst among the African-American community. Was that an uncomfortable experience for the board? I know it was for Irma. And for me personally, because um, one night, you remember our board meetings were in a room <laughs> about the quarter of a size, maybe less than this room, and there was just barely room for the board table for the seven of us, and then maybe four or five rows to a wall where the faculty and the vice chancellors and presidents would sit. And I was seated facing the door and all of a sudden a crowd of African Americans, all of whom I knew and had worked with and been friends with, walked in and lined that other wall. And um, one of their leaders leaned down over <laughs> behind Dr. Uh, C.A. Robertson and l yelled at us. And our, our process was we never responded to the public. We always would listen to them and then just move on. And she said, if you don't take Irma Johnson, Hadley, was her name Hadley at the time? Yeah, it just Johnson, Irma Johnson. It has to be because she's African-American and a woman. And it was all I could do to keep from standing up and saying to this person who I thought was a friend, <clears throat> never in my life have I discriminated against someone because of their race, their gender, their religion, their culture but I'm not gonna appoint somebody or hire somebody or offer someone something because of the same issues. So she was not chosen at that time and it was disappointing to her. Um, the search process is a very complex, <laughs> tedious and expensive process and you rely a lot on the professionals who help you. And the board did that and came up with their selection and I will say Irma is disappointed as she must have been, handled it with Irma Grace, never quit working her job and doing it to the best of her ability. And I will always love and respect her for that because that had to have been very difficult. Jim Warden was the interim chancellor yeah. for a while and then very tragically suddenly died in, in December of 1996. Mm -hmm. The board met and uh, I was on South Campus, as I recall, and came out and said that Larry Darlich would be the new interim chancellor. And that did not set well with the African-American community. Again, they thought Irma had been rebuffed, and indeed some very senior TCC CELT members, cabinet members at the time, were wondering, well, what is this? He's been here a whole 10 months. Mm -hmm. so how did that come about? You know, Bill, I really don't remember the details of that. Um, we were probably, part of the thinking was probably, and you do this, we did this this last time with um, uh, an interim situation. You try to choose someone who's not going to be a candidate for that position. And so the thought and maybe hope was that Irma would be a candidate for replacing. Um, and Dr. Darlich probably wouldn't be because he was so new and didn't have the history that Irma had. But again, there was a lot of unhappiness and disappointment and probably anger. And that's it. In fact, I look back on it. The, the woman who yelled at us at the board table that night, we were on a couple of boards together and she quit speaking to me. And years later, <clears throat> when Irma was chancellor, and they were good friends, of course, I told Irma, I said, you tell mm -hmm, that this town's too small and life is too short. 
and um, we need to get together and overcome this. And she must have because we ended on a good note. And in fact, I recently had a, a good visit with her and she was dying of pancreatic cancer too. And I felt like we had come to peace with each other and the issues we'd confronted. The board brought in uh, Leonardo de la Garza yes. as the new chancellor. And he came in and one of the things he started looking at was our finances. And he mm -hmm. said, you have not been aggressive enough in raising taxes to raise the money to take care of a lot of needs that I see. And for some people thought that was maybe a slap at CA, that maybe uh, that he was, he shouldn't come in and say something like that. What was your view on, I remember Bobby McGee agreed with him wholeheartedly. Did the rest of the board kind of think, yeah, maybe we have been too slow in coming around on this? I, I think so. CA had been here from the beginning of time and, and we'd always done it his way and he would kept us solvent and uh, out of financial jail. And so we depended on him uh, to, to do that and, and to keep us going. And D Dr. De La Garza did have some new ideas and ultimately we made some major changes in our financial operations and taxing of the citizens, which I thought would probably get us all ousted and impeached, but not a blip on the screen. And um, that pay as you go um, system was celebrated at our 50th anniversary uh, down on the river, which was another controversial uh, campus uh, decision. But, um, and he was there to help us burn that last bond. So we'll see how it goes from here. There's already talk of maybe going into a different system. <laughs> pay as you go worked very well for us for a long time, but as you say, maybe the time has come where it just cannot be used for an endeavor that right. we might be like building another uh, exactly. bricks and mortar campus right. and the, all the infrastructure on the present campuses that need replacing. So is that being rethought? Yes, that we're looking at all of that. And in fact, one of our board members who is no longer on the board um, began to question our pay-as-you-go system. And that's that's not sustainable, he, he would say. And you all need to think about other ways of financing bigger projects because we were already we had done maybe two facilities long range planning and we could see where we were falling apart. And then the tornado hit Northwest and really got our attention. And we knew we were um, possibly in trouble with the pay as you go and that other methods needed to be part of the plan. In 1999, Tarrant County Junior College became Tarrant County College. Mm -hmm. Was there any hesitancy on the part of the board except what will Dr. Rushing say? What will Dickens Garrett say? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was it was just we knew it was a bold move, and we knew that some of the senior universities in the area would think we were about to encroach on their operations and their students, and possibly become a four year uh, institution. And so we were careful every time it came up that we would say we will remain a community college. I. Uh, it made me th remember that when TCJC was on the ballot, that some of the folks at TCU really didn't like the idea of a junior college getting in their way, which of course in the end turned out to be a wonderful partnership and collaboration and matriculation <clears throat> situation for our students. In fact, I was just at the Bob Bolin, um, or the Bolin, I should say, Bob and Jim, uh, math competition ceremony and a couple of students got full rides to mm. TCU. You just can't argue with that. So uh, we we have overcome that little thing. But <clears throat> excuse me, going back to um, changing the name, it it was nervousy, <laughs> but a lot of junior colleges were doing it across the country. I think there's just a handful left that still say junior college, and P and it took me a while to stop saying TCJC and probably a lot of others too. So. Another big change came when uh, uh, the college had had a foundation uh, before you came, the Friends of TCJC. Yes. It did not have a paid staff. It really wasn't <clears throat> all that successful at raising money. But in 2001, the foundation was resurrected with a paid staff. Uh, you had been um, in, involved in lots of organizations that, of which fundraising was part of their process. I assume you probably welcomed this change and 
and have a lot to do with it. And we, you were on the original board. Of yes. Now. And it did um, suffer rebirth several times with lots of staff changes. And I had been involved, uh, probably the foundation most closely related in style and function was the um, Community Foundation, which we created when we became aware that the Dallas Community Foundation realized there was significant money <laughs> in downtown and residential Fort Worth and started coming over here and looking at some of the donors. And Bob Decker, uh, a prominent attorney in Fort Worth and uh, active at the United Way and on the board as was I, went to Glenn Wilkins, who was then the CEO yes. of United Way and explained community foundations to him. And he knew because Tom Beach, who was running the Tandy Foundation at the time, had come from a community foundation. And we said, we need one of these in Tarrant County to for families or individuals who had a lot of money, could create a foundation, but didn't want to staff it and run it. So it's like a, a foundation pool. Someone is there to invest and manage and make grants with the help of the donor, but a committee or a board uh, making the final decision. So Glenn Wilkins, who was a retired Alcon exec, and in retirement got nervous and antsy about being retired, and so he took over United Way and did a wonderful job for many years. He agreed and he gave us office space and uh, an executive director and a secretary and a phone line, and off we went. And that foundation is now um, on its own, very well financed with its own board, making huge grants to nonprofits in the community. So I knew from that experience that Growing a foundation takes a lot of time and patience and gaining um, the respect and, and the recognition from potential donors. And um, there, it, was, it was not going to be instant success, and it has not been. We, I looked last night, and I think we're at 30 million, which is fine, but we could be a lot more. And uh, Dr. Giovannini understands foundations <laughs> and certainly Joe Mac Dr. Joe McIntosh, who's the CEO, and Liz Sisk, who's number two over there. And um, they're working together. We have uh, what we call an MOU, a, member, a memo of under, memorandum of understanding. And uh, I think that foundation will grow to much greater heights. One of the issues was when you go to a taxpayer and you say, may I have some of your wealth for our foundation, the almost always response was, I'm, I'm giving you my taxes. Why do you need more money, my private money for a private foundation? Well, all you need to do is spell out the needs <clears throat> of some of our students and how hard it is even to meet our tuition requests and bo books and all of that that goes with it and they need assistance beyond financial aid or um, Pell Grants or other things that put them into debt. We, we give them money to continue their studies and um, they don't have to pay it back. Another problem with uh, community <coughs> college foundations seems to be not only that people say, oh no, I pay you taxes, but universities can go to their alumni, wealthy yes. alumni. Yes. Very different from a community <laughs> college. Yes, we don't have many of those. <laughs> But it, it's really been heartwarming to see the list of donors that do recognize the value of a community college and who, either because of their own personal experience or their business's experience with our well-trained workers, um, feel that it's, it's worth their time and effort to give us some of their wealth. And uh, some of them are on the board <clears throat> and help us identify others who might be helpful to us. Dr. Warden's death and Joe Ed Spencer's retirement left two vice chancellor positions, key vice chancellor, uh, academic affairs and financial affairs vacant. Chancellor De La Garza kept those open for a long time and was sort of fond of telling people, well, I am the chief academic and chief financial officer. I know that some board members, I will mention Bobby McGee again, had a real problem with this. How did the board feel as a whole? You know, you um, as a board member, and you've hired this person, and you know that they bring their own style. And um, while they are my, as a board member's employee, um, 
I like to say, I'm just a little old housewife from the West Side, what do I know? And here comes someone with all these degrees and all this experience and all this bravado. <laughs> and you think, well, maybe I don't understand the situation so well. Maybe I'm not um, understanding uh, what we need here at TCC. Bobby, of course, came from a totally different banking uh, investment uh, officer background. And um, he was critical of a lot of things we did and became very frustrated with us and once told me that this was not a lifetime appointment, which was his way of saying, get out. <laughs> but he decided he would get out. And, and I, I respected his judgment calls as well. But um, I think the board was at a place where they trusted De La Garza. We hired him. We knew what his credentials were. We knew what his track record was. And we were willing to let him lead us down the path. But at some point, uh, I think it was became clear, enough's enough. Let's get some people with some qualifications in these positions. In 2002, the board instituted a self-evaluation <laughs> procedure, which, as far as we can tell, was the only one of its kind in the country. Uh, were you proud of that? And does it still exist in any way? Yes and yes. And it changes every year. <laughs> we, we redesign it and <clears throat> reevaluate it. And um, again, depending on who's sitting at the end of the table in the chancellor's position, um, it, it gets tweaked and sometimes thrown out. And here's a new form that just came out from wherever. Let's try it this year. And I thought that was pretty awful until I got involved in another organization and they're struggling with the same thing. How do you evaluate yourself and your fellow board member? How am I going to turn around and tell Dr. Gwen Morrison, who's been on the board 10 more years or more than, you know, 10 more than I have, that she's not doing a good job? Everybody brings a different style and a different manner to the table. You have to assume that their intentions are honorable and that students and faculty and the institution are at the top of their list. Um, that's maybe not always true or not as intense as your own uh, feelings. But uh, again, you work through it. Uh, we also evaluate the chancellor. And one board member's really negative rating can throw the whole um, grade assessment off. And that happened one year. And I suggested that we fold the um, evaluation system, but it had to go into uh, the chancellor's file. And it didn't look good, but it was that one unhappy board members uh, who left soon after under um, questionable conditions. <laughs> so, you know, I, and my suggestion of just throwing that in the trash can was not an appropriate one either, but I felt it was so unfair and did not reflect the other six members of the board's um, evaluations. One of the things that came <clears throat> up in the late 90s, and this is, uh, uh, I think, an example of Dr. De La Garza's wanting to really get the college on the move, was talk of a downtown facility. Mm -hmm. The first discussion was a technical center, which would be across the street from the Mayo and Center. And they looked at it and there just wasn't enough room. And it grew and then finally it was to be a uh, whole freestanding campus, which would be our, our fifth campus. We went to the taxpayers. There was, uh, there was going to be a three cent tax increase set aside for the uh, acquisition and building of a downtown campus. But people said, well, where is it going to be? Well, we don't know. <laughs> What's it going to offer? <laughs> well, we'll have to decide that. And I think Mr. O.K. Carter was one of the journalists who kind of took us to task and said, this is all very vague. So was the board sort of concerned about putting that out? In, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it, it just wasn't our style, so to speak. And, and we had never before and or ever since gone to the taxpayers with the, an incomplete proposal. Interestingly, we were recently in Austin <laughs> at the university and um, at a chancellor's, which is the whole system, all 11 campuses around the state. 
and they <laughs> they initiated a fundraising campaign akin to this. No goal as to how much they wanted to raise, no plan as to how the funds might be used. And they are into the million, we were back later. And so what happened? They are collecting millions of dollars down there because the trust <laughs> in the system management, and I guess the hope for a name on a building <laughs> was so great. <laughs> These people are just giving money without any real plan for it, which Gordon and I were like, mm, <laughs> not our style. <laughs> well, the site for the campus, campus was chosen, the bluff along the Trinity River. Yeah. One of the sites that had been proposed and rejected had been offered by the Bass family, uh, Ed Bass. Uh, do you think that not going with that suggestion maybe caused a little trouble down the line? Possibly, except that we made sure that the model for the new Trinity, what we now call the Trinity River East Campus, and this was before the Radio Shack building was in the mix. We had this beautiful um, uh, model of the way the buildings might look and how they would cross the river and the river was running through it. And the first person we came, we had to come, invited uh, to come see this model was Ed Bass. And it had lights, it was really pretty, dramatic and he looked at it and he looked under and he walked around and he just oh it's just beautiful that'll be just wonderful <laughs> and about three years later he looked out of his window and he said what in the heck is going on down there <laughs> and of course by then we'd done you know the land purchase we had a big hole under Belknap Street <laughs> we had architects and engineers and people everywhere construction and we're well into the project and he demanded um, a recall. He wanted uh, a reassessment of the whole project and brought in his own people. And we hired an independent, supposedly, person who had no nothing to gain. He wasn't going to get a job out of it or anything. And um, one, at least one of our board members, was ready to wrap the whole thing in tinfoil or plastic and wait it out. Wait for what? <laughs> you can't just leave that big hole there in these half done buildings. I think we should wait. Well, long story short, we had a couple of meetings and I'll never forget. One of the meetings was on the, we were in the Radio Shack building. I guess by then had we bought it, I, we must have, or we were just meeting there. Anyway, Ed and about eight of his cronies walked in and I thought, oh, this will be an interesting meeting. Northwest campus. <laughs> was it Northwest campus? Yes. I just remember an auditorium. And so anyway, he was there and brought his folks and they were there to tell us how we were about to make a big mistake. We were into the mistake. Long story short, they went away. The architects and the consultants all said, you can't stop now. And so we continued the problem was Katrina happened in New Orleans. And I remember it, I'm, one of my claims to fame is that I was on one of the, the original Streams and Valleys Committee, which was set up independent of the city, which I've always kind of laughed about. We were not approved. We just went to work, thanks to Phyllis Tilly. And we built low water dams and we put in bike paths. <laughs> And we knew from the very beginning, because we were being coached by the Corps of Engineers and by the Tarrant Regional Water District, thou shalt not put anything within a certain number of hundreds of feet of the river because that's flood control and that's why those big banks are there. If the Benbrook Lake has to be let out, that water has to come through town and it has to you know, hopefully stay within the banks. Well, any of you that were here in the 40s remember the Great Flood, and there's still pictures hanging at Carshons of Montgomery Ward underwater and lots of downtown underwater. So those, of, those people who grew up in Fort Worth remember that flood, and they don't ever want to see it again. So that's why that river was dug and, and banked as it is. So when I saw that building, that model, I was the one who said, you can't do that. You can't put pylons into the riverbank. And the architect said, don't worry, we've got it covered. Well, what he meant was we had a congresswoman who was working with the Corps of Engineers 
to get us permission to do exactly what we had never done in the 30 years I'd been in, involved. So sure enough, Katrina came and the Corps went, well, maybe we better rethink this because of the destruction of New Orleans and other places. So um, we, we stopped the construction on the south side to, and confined it to the south side of the river at about the same time, actually Bobby McGee was on a golf course or a cocktail party or something and got some inappropriate information that Radio Shack <laughs> was having a little trouble keeping up the rental payments to the REIT uh, real Estate Investment Trust in Germany that they had been sustained by for several years. And the REIT wanted to sell that building. Because of that pay-as-you-go situation, we had the cash to pay for that building, which is unheard of. So we bought the building. Radio Shack rented uh, space from us up until last year. And that was a, a means of income for us. We had to remodel several parts of the building and we had to, we stopped construction. That's luckily we hadn't gone across and uh, we'd even had some people say, I'd like the bridge named after me. And we said, <laughs> show us how. And of course, all of that went away. And uh, we have what is now won several awards for design and function, a beautiful East campus and a, I still call it the Radio Shack building, and I shouldn't, the Trinity River Campus building, which is oversubscribed mm. almost any day of the week. There was a press release sent out uh, when we started uh, construction, we're going to start construction on the Bluff campus. It said the cost would be $135 million. And I think if the administration ever wanted to take back anything it said, it was that price yeah. figure because the ink hadn't dried on the Star Telegram when it was up to 170, yeah. and then over 200, and then 300. So, was the move to buy the Radio Shack com complex in part just the end of a series of frustration on the board's part about the fact that we just could not stop the cost increase, we could not get permission from the core. That was a it, bad time. It was <laughs> one of the more difficult periods in my time on the board. Um, there, um, there was a website created by Steve Murren, very popular man in town. And um, I think I still have copies of it. In fact, I think it's still online. He never did take it down, but he really took in after us. And, and I can see, I mean, now people are taking in after the Trinity River Vision people for the same reason, or essentially the same reasons. A project that's gotten out of control with design and intent and certainly finances. And, and that campus probably qualified for all the same criticism. Um, and, and I can't um, justify it, I can't explain it. Um, as some people would say, it was above my pay grade. Uh, you know, I, I remember we questioned the consultants time after time after time. Oh, don't don't worry, we've got it under control. Trust us. And again, the little old housewife from the West Side thought, well, maybe this is how it goes <laughs> in the business building world. But it was not a good operation at the time. Fortunately for us, the camp, both campuses as I said, are oversubscribed. We can hardly admit, we don't admit all the students who want to go there. We have an early college high school with um, UNT, the uh, Texas Medical uh, is students who are just unbelievable. They're the Einsteins of the next century. And um, they arrive in school buses. Tarleton's getting ready to hold night classes there. Um, when people want to have an event on a campus, they always call that one first. <laughs> Dr. Munoz probably spends a good portion of his time dealing with reservations for space. Um, the cafeteria, the eating establishment stayed there where the Radio Shack employees ate. And I went there a couple of times when they were still in the building. They were so undone with the fact that the community college had taken over there space which had been long in coming it was a beautiful building and they were working there and here these 
interlopers were not only in the building, they're eating in our restaurant. They wouldn't even look us in the eye. And if you met one coming down the hall, they wouldn't greet you. So Tahita Fulkerson, who was the president of that campus, finally just took her gracious self up to the CEO's office and just sat there until he agreed to see her. And she said, we're going to be living and working together. We've got to get this to a point where it's acceptable and friendly and not hostile. Only she could have pulled that off. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> parking became an issue because they wanted their spaces. We needed ours. It was, it was a difficult time for a lot, even after we moved into the new building. When Bobby McGee came forward to the board with the idea, hey, the, the Radio Shack complex is for sale, let's think about buying that and making it the campus. What was the reaction of the board? Uh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and it, I have another part of my life where I do relocation work, and I had done a lot of work for Radio Shack over the years, bringing new executives in. In my mind and in the mind of the community, they were growing. They were adding significant people from all over the world. They were um, John Roach had stepped down and he hired Lynn Roberts and then Lynn stepped down and it was Lynn's building. And he and Marvin Gerard, the CEO of Pier One, had kind of a fun contest going between whose building was going to get finished first and which one would be better. And then ultimately both companies, Pier One is still in existence but struggling and of course Radio Shack may it rest in peace. No one can really believe they're really, really gone. But um, they are, and they were going. And um, it, it made sense that that building might be for sale, but we couldn't even imagine ourselves in such a grown-up building. And um, again, because Bobby brought it to the board, and he had it on good information, and we checked it out, and it was true. They were having serious trouble and again, long story short, we bought it and it's ours. And um, it's, you know, we, we've had to add parking lots. Um, it, the other issue was when Radio Shack put that building there, they displaced a public housing community. And that was very emotional for a lot of people, including one of our board members. And you remember the um, Leonard Brothers trolley, that was gone, you know, so, a lot of things changed in what seemed like a long time, but it was a heartbeat, and we've all had to adjust to it. While all this was going on, there there was some friction arising between the board and Chancellor Bella Garza. Part of it was due to the new campus, the cost overruns, but there were other things uh, at work too. I, uh, Mr. McGee seems to come up a lot in this conversation, <laughs> but uh, he, on behalf of the board, the board asked the chancellor for the evaluations of the Kelt members, the uh, executives who reported directly to the chancellor with the eye of a su possible succession. The chancellor refused, and that went on for some time, even though these uh, evaluations are public record. How did the board feel about that? How did you feel about that? We didn't like it. <laughs> it was the beginning of the end. And, and I obviously cannot go into details, but um, I can tell you that I <laughs> ended up in a conference room in my son's law firm, <laughs> and I asked him to please stay in his office. I was dealing with one of his attorneys and um, who was representing Dr. De La Garza, and uh, at one point, I just asked all the attorneys to leave the room. And I told Leonardo, I, I'd never called him that. And I just said, Leonardo, it's time. And he looked me in the eye and he said, okay. And so called the attorneys back in and I said, start the paperwork. It's just, you know, <laughs> legalese is important. And obviously I believe in it and live it daily. And um, I'm very proud of my husband and my son and my father-in-law who practiced keeping people according to the law. But at some point, you just have to go for the gut. <laughs> and he knew that, and, and I did too. And it, I, I hired him with my six colleagues. So I had to admit, we had had several good years, but I had to admit there that's not how you want a relationship to end. But a year before that, 
then uh, when the board offered Dr. De La Garza a one-year contract in which he was very upset that you managed to, as you were president of the board at this time, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bell had retired. And it was a, a very interesting time. That was the same day that we announced the that we had bought the Radio Shack complex. <laughs> and then uh, he, here we came with to change the offer and <clears throat> make the contract three years. So that intervening time from uh, June 2008 to June 2009, did things just sort of continue to go downhill till apparently both you and he said enough's enough? Yeah, we um, trying to give him a graceful exit. You're still dealing with human beings and uh, titles be damned, excuse my French. You're dealing with a human being, with a family, with a reputation, and you try to make it as pleasant as unpleasant can be. While all this was going on, those of us in the trenches were looking at the board <laughs> and saying, what's going on here? Because the board had been known for its collegiality, for its cohesiveness, and all of a sudden there was all of this friction among the board members. Uh, what what happened? How did that disappear? Was it just too much stuff going on? Well, I think, and I think we had more grown-up board members. When I first came on this board, meetings were really boring. <laughs> and I don't even know, I look back, <clears throat> excuse me, how much. Now I have a one-on-one -on -one with the chancellor so that I can see the draft agenda and I can ask any questions that I might have in not understanding the issues. Then we have the governance committee meeting, which is open to the public and staff, anyone who has anything on the agenda is there so that if board members have questions or concerns. It helps the staff sometimes rewrite the, uh, even the way it's listed on the agenda. There was something last month and I thought, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, they reworded it. And because it's in draft form and within the 72 hours before becoming public information, even though the meeting is open to the public, and then if, if the, they always um, offer a narrative of several pages beyond the proposed motion, and as we read through it, if there's something that's not clear, or one day I found a mistake in a date or a number of years or something. So it gives us a chance to kind of clean up our act before we go public, public. And it's, it's helpful to the board. I think they have come to realize how professional, how skilled, how experienced, our people are, starting with the chancellor and the vice chancellors and the presidents and the deans. These people weren't hired just off the street or in a vacuum. They came to us with resumes. I'm always astounded at the wording on the resumes, and I don't see them until it's over, except for the chancellor. But we have an incredible workforce here of professionals that if we can't trust them, yes, we should ask questions. And each of us is at the table with a different level of understanding ourselves and experience and skills. And some are <laughs> more detail oriented in their questions. And, but I've never seen a staff member to this day, if they didn't know the answer, I'll get back to you, or let me look that up for you. And then, the whole board gets the answer, not just that one board member, but everybody gets whatever um, that person, usually through Reg's office, um, we find out what the answer to the question was. But 99% of the time, they know the answer, and they they know it so well, it's almost difficult for them mm -hmm. to explain it to lay people, and or they've done it in such a way that we don't understand, or they've left it out because it wasn't significant, and somebody says, well, what about? And they'll have the answer for us. And I've always been very appreciative and respectful of that. So. What you seem to be saying is the board grew into a true governance yes. board. Yeah. And not just, some people have said, the rubber stamp. Right. Mm. And that's why every board meeting I tell the audience, because they either don't know or didn't come to the governance committee meeting, we've been there, done that. We vetted this material. I, I still bring my notebook to the table in case someone wants to see it, but it's on our computers, and I really don't like the computer, so that's another reason I have the notebook. But I notice the chancellor does the same thing, so I don't feel as guilty. 
<laughs> but there it is in black and white. And um, only on rare occasion do they switch out the papers to correct whatever we ask for at the governance committee meeting. This week we pulled two items because Miss Petty decided maybe there were some adjustments to me. They were actually money coming back to us. And so we said, we'll make it the amount higher. Mm -hmm. But she realized that the numbers weren't quite right. And it was less than the 72 hours that the public uh, requires for disclosure. So we just pulled it from the agenda till next month. Shortly after Dr. De La Garza left, uh, there was a very long closed meeting of the board and Irma Johnson Hadley was named interim chancellor. It was longer than many of us thought it might be. Now, was the what meeting was the, yeah, the, the meeting after, before you came out and named her was uh, we thought that that might be a slam dunk, but I guess it wasn't. Well, because most of us had been around for the other search and we knew um, and maybe the search before that our non search. Uh, and so we understood the implications of handing the title to someone without uh, a verified search uh, with a consultant and a fee, thousands and thousands of dollars. And because of the history of consideration of her before, and we didn't want it to look like, okay, so it's finally yours, get over it. <laughs> we wanted to feel like she was the best choice at the time. And, um, so through discussion and um, I, I don't remember anyone being ugly about it or arguing. I think mainly we wanted to be sure that it was the best thing for the college and the students and the faculty and staff at the time. And um, it was a unanimous vote that came out. In 2010, Irma was chancellor. It would seem like we had sort of weathered the storm and things were calming down. But then in the board election uh, that year, O.K. Carter came on to the board and Bill Greenhill came on to the board. And uh, the upshot was that you were voted out of the presidency. <laughs> I was bullied out. <laughs> a, a four to three. How did that happen? And it had to well, hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I just, uh, you know, I can laugh now, but I look back on that and say, how did that happen? Bill Greenhill asked me to coffee. And we went to Starbucks on at Montgomery Plaza, and I paid for the coffee. I didn't know. I thought he was coming to get wisdom from me about how to be a good board member. And he looked at me and he said, "I have the votes, and I'm going to be the new president." I said, "You can't do that. That's called a walking quorum. It's against the law." He and I said, "Why don't you serve a couple of <laughs> years and see how things go? Mm -hmm. What what is it you want to change?" And if you know Bill, he's an interesting guy. He kind of fell over. He was in the booth side of the table and he kind of fell over and then he came back and he said, I just think I'd be a better president. And I thought, well, it, does he really have, has he really already lobbied the votes? I can't imagine. We don't ever do that. Well, he had mm. and he did and he was president. Mm. <laughs> Now, he was president later, but in 2010, I bet he, it, it was Joe Hudson. It, that he we, got it for Joe. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. He wanted Joe to be it. And and Joe just came out of nowhere. I mean, we had never heard of him or worked with him or done anything with him. But um, he really felt like, in fact, his first announcement after being elected president was, uh, we're going to rotate the gavel amongst the board members. And I remember Angela Robinson was in the front row, our in-house attorney. And she looked, I looked at her and she looked at me and I thought, and after the meeting adjourned, she went up to her, she said, Mr. Hudson, you can't do that. That's no, that's not workable. Well, I think everyone should have a shot at this. And she said, well, then you'll have to elect them to it. So he, I don't know what Joe, Joe had actually been a, a legislator somewhere in Arkansas. Arkansas. And so he was into politics and doing things the political way, but he did not have the community college system down. And he lasted, what, another two years or the one year after he was had been there two years, he took the gavel, and then he just said, I'm out of here. This isn't any fun. <laughs> well, you were board president, and then uh, Joe Hudson Joe was Hudson, board. And then Bill. Then, then Kristen Vandergriff was interim. Yes. And then there was another election, and she she was uh, running for president, 
as was Bill Greenhill. Right. And four to three vote, Bill Greenhill was elected. But in And I think I got my time at Starbucks mixed up. I think it was after Joe. And I I'm not sure how what happened with Joe. He, he must have done some backhaul politicking to, mm. to get elected. But, but you, you know, it was a message to me. Mm. We don't like the way you handle the job. So who, who am I to argue with six other people? <laughs> if you count Kristen's interim, there were four chancellors in 14 months. Yeah. <laughs> what does that tell the people at TCC? <laughs> what does that tell the community? It, it was um, a time of turmoil. <laughs> that, that's what it tells them. We could not get our act together. Um, we had a lot of personal agendas going. Aside from what was going on with the board, the new chancellor, Irma, was putting things in high gear. <laughs> it was kind of like we had been in neutral and when all of a sudden <laughs> it was warp speed. And that was, that was yeah, Irma's way. Irma was a woman on fire. <laughs> and uh, we did so many things. We started early college high schools. We uh, embarked on our achieving the dream journey. Mm. There was all this new focus on student success. Uh, was there ever a feeling on the board, I know there was with the faculty, that we were moving too far, too soon, too fast? Yeah. Well, and what that did to the faculty and to every the administration management teams, it was just above and beyond duties and work and trying to figure out the best way to do an early college high school to work out the contracts and the Achieving the Dream Committee meetings. And I went to most of them, just went on and on. And, you know, we became a model for the country, and I think it was based on the amount of time we spent on it. But, um, you know, to know Irma is to love her and to just try to keep up with her. Mm -hmm. And that was so her style and wanting to do the very, it was like it was, she had kept all this inside her, all those years of rejection. And here she was at the table in the, in the throne seat, and she was going to, see to it that we tried new things and made new strides and achieved new success. But, you know, she never lost sight of who that was for. And I'd get on an elevator with her and there'd be a couple of students on there. And by the time we reached whatever floor we were going to, she had all of their resumes, <laughs> <laughs> biographical sketches, whether or not they needed scholarship help, were they being advised on their curriculum choices. <laughs> she was amazing. So, um, and she cared about her staff, I think, all the people who worked with her. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, Joe Rohde on Northwest mm -hmm. Campus told me that the, the faculty and campus administrators just could not keep up with what no. was coming down the path. He's, he said, they've had, we have initiative fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that, and, um, and I believe it. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how many of the other board members were involved, but I tried to keep up because I felt like it was important. I understood what achieving the dream was all about. But uh, an early college high school is an entirely new concept and how it has grown. And I don't know why every parent in town doesn't take advantage of it. Um, but it it was a deal to, to keep up, not with Irma, but with her initiatives. <laughs> No, there were some people here in the Mayo and Center said, don't let her go to another conference. She'll come back with something <laughs> else that she wants meeting. done next week. <clears throat> she and I went to a conference together, and we were in Baltimore, and we were both in my room at some point, and I pulled the curtains, and right across the river, this hotel was on the river, was this old power plant that had been converted <laughs> into uh, kind of like uh, that area in Boston, uh, Faneuil Hall and all of the shops and restaurants down on the harbor and I said look Irma there's the TXU building in Baltimore <laughs> and I pulled the curtain I said don't think about it <laughs> and we're still thinking about it <laughs> at this same time though there was plenty to celebrate because the Trinity River campus opened uh, Trek opened uh, Trinity River East campus for the <clears> next <throat> year as you walked through those facilities and looked at the students as you uh, saw people in the plaza the famous below ground, underground plaza with its tunnel, and, and what we had achieved, was it all worth it? I think so. Um, one of the smart things Irma did, as soon as we could walk those halls and those sidewalks, is she started putting together tour groups. And guess who was in the first one? Ed Bass and 
Johnny Campbell, Bill Baker, the Sundance Square people. And I said, I want to go with you because I bore the brunt of this. <laughs> I want to celebrate this. And, and I went on several other tours and she would <laughs> take them all through the building and then um, down onto the plaza and that beautiful water feature. And she'd get to that archway under the street and she said, and she was quoting one of our critics, someone I knew, had, our kids had gone to school together, and he got in my face one night at a meeting and said, you're going to get raped and mugged under that dark tunnel. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I hope it's not you. And I backed off from him, and I said, I don't think so. I think you don't understand. It's going to be very open, and you're going to be able to see downtown, all the buildings. So she would get under that tunnel and she said this is where mrs appleman's going to get raped and mugged <laughs> and people i said irma you've got to quit saying that they don't know what that means <laughs> they think you're threatening me <laughs> so she did quit saying that but we did we gave tours to you know every business person and club and neighborhood association starting with the ones who had been on our case because we wanted people to see how really beautiful and functional those spaces were and the whole campus was it is a showcase and it's been featured in fact I found a magazine I was going through some things that might go into the archives and I found um, a, an article with beautiful photographs and the architect firm had been named mm -hmm. architect firm of the century because of that design when you were taking those people through and pointing out this and that, was there an inward feeling of self-satisfaction? It was almost like a nanny yes, some, you right. <laughs> not so much self-satisfaction as relief and pride that we had accomplished it. It wasn't a perfect um, process and it had been expensive and painful, but what we had, uh, the students will never know, you know, the stu and, and the painful past will go away except for one magazine article that I still have where the article, the writer managed to spell it all out. But we need that for history. If nothing else, if and when we face something similar, we have learned um, hopefully and are, we'll be able to keep tighter reins on the people we're working with who are professionals in their own right. Um, but. I don't think the board ever lost the feeling of uh, responsibility to the taxpayer, uh, knowing these were public monies we were spending. But um, even our main, in fact, Ed Bass had Johnny Campbell come back, make an appointment to come back to look at that utility building that's right on the street that you pass by a hundred times a year and you don't really even notice because it's so nondescript. Mm -hmm but he was already thinking in terms of future projects and how um, simple and efficient and attractive or unattractive that building was that no one noticed it in the midst of all this beautiful architecture. So to me, that was, <laughs> that was like, okay, you got it. <laughs> and you just can't walk by or drive by and not be proud of that building and what it's doing for the healthcare professions on that east end and then everything else in the Radio Shack building. <laughs> well, the parade of initiatives just sort of kept going. And one of the things, one of the things that it encompassed was online learning. Oh, yes. We had had online learning since back in the 70s. Right. But it really took off uh, in oh, um, 2011, 12, where we had such an online presence. And it became so large, this is one of Irma's things, that we want to bring online learning and weekend college and dual credit all under one umbrella. It will be a sixth campus. It will be called TCC Connect. Right. And the faculty, again, had <laughs> lots of angst. Now, you had a reputation, and I think it was well-deserved, as someone the faculty could talk to. Did they talk to you about this? Yes, and you know, I had to remind them when we were building and when we were designing the Southeast campus, and the library space came on the table, there was a question about whether we should build a library. You remember that? And because everything was gonna go digital after tomorrow. And so the compromise finally was, there will still be libraries in the world, thankfully, I thought. But the under part, the, under the floor of that library are one million plugs and connections. 
And so it was a compromise, but a, a good one. And um, certainly our libraries are still well utilized and <clears throat> important to us. Um, and TCC Connect has become a given and an important part of our operation and well utilized. My own niece did her entire master's work at Texas Women's University to get her library science master's online. She went up there a couple of times a month, maybe maybe once a month. She was working full time, she had a child. It's perfect for her. My daughter did, got her master's in New York at Columbia while working full time at Microsoft, who by the way, wouldn't pay for graduate work. Um, it cost almost as much as a wedding. <laughs> but anyway, she it was perfect for her because she went on campus even less times than Carrie went to TWU, mm -hmm. which in New York was a blessing. She didn't have to do that. But more and more people are using online as a convenient, effective way of achieving their um, educational goals. It's just a reality. I don't think I could do it um, as an old timer, mm -hmm. but certainly my children and my grandchildren, it will be very natural for them. It's TCC Connect has had some something of a bumpy ride coming yes. of age, but yeah. when you look at how complex that is to put all that together, I can't even the, the faculty was saying, so I'm going to report to my campus president for face-to-face -face courses and over here for online courses. Yeah. That Was there a, ever a thought that maybe we should have thought things out a little more before going into it full force. Well, I, yes, always, but it, it was so new that you went with the person that you thought <laughs> could manage it, and it didn't always work out. But I think now, I maybe need to check the coffee shop, um, that it it's running fairly well. And they have their own space at Radio Shack now, at, at, at Trinity <laughs> River. And um, they're very proud of it, and they're very proud of the work they're doing, and I, have not had any complaints from students, uh, which I occasionally will get a formal letter or email of complaint, or I call it my produce counter consulting work. If I hear something more than twice, I take it to the chancellor and I say, we need to look into this. I'm, something's not working, mm. so. But it seems to be working now. I think so, I hope so. <laughs> Check with me this afternoon. <laughs> And speaking of Trinity River Campus and uh, TCC Connect being there, before too long, uh, the administration offices will move there. I was very surprised and <laughs> I must admit a little shocked and saddened when I drove up Lancaster and saw the for sale the for sign. Sale sign. It, it just kind of got me. I, me too. I, I didn't know it was going up and I came to get into the parking lot <clears throat> and I saw that and I thought, what's for sale? You know, and I realized we are, <laughs> and and I'm not particularly crazy about the sign. I don't think it's very attractive or eye catching, so which I mentioned to the young men who are, <laughs> they're all my children. <laughs> I helped raise them. I said, I don't like your sign. <laughs> You'll notice it hasn't changed, yeah. but um, we've had some nibbles and some things are working, um, and I, you know, my goal in life is to be sure we preserve the Mayo and name somehow when we move. And I don't know how that will happen and I won't be around to be bossy about it. But I, hopefully the board and others will say, you can't just do away. You've got to do a hallway with a big picture or something, a room, an auditorium. But, I, and you know, Dr. Rushing, his philosophy was thou shalt not have the central administration building anywhere near a campus because that makes it look like that's the favored campus. And so we've, <laughs> between Gwen and, and I, we've tried to honor that, but I think uh, as with so many other things, we're in a new place. And um, when we opened TCC Connect, we had to add a, a door, a, a new entrance to that building with a different address. And we may have to, I, I'm just, this is me talking. We may have to do that with the administration that we moved down there. And the foundation may have to move. And in a way, it'll be better because we're all in the same space, the same campus, whereas now we're pretty spread out. There's some other departments that may join us mm -hmm. there, but I think that will be the location of choice. And um, you look back on that, that's pretty amazing. You think how many years ago Radio Shack 
was there, one of the preeminent companies of the world. Mm -hmm. And now the community college is there and doing very well, thank you. <laughs> you mentioned that the college has kind of been a new place. And I think that really came home to a lot of people when Irma died in yeah. October of 2015. And uh, you know, skipping over De La Garza, you had a progression from Rushing to Robertson to Irma. And it seemed like the really, and it coincided with the 50th anniversary, that that age of the college was over. It was the end of an era. Mm -hmm. Did the board have that feeling? I don't Especially know Especially those of you who yeah. had been very close to Irma for years. Right, and, and I don't know that others did, but I did, and, and I came to really appreciate her and her attitude about things. It helped me overcome some, why am I here? Why am I doing this? She was always pretty positive. And she had little sayings that, um, ending with, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, get over it and you can do this. And that's how she tackled her illness too. And uh, you, you can't help but uh, admire someone with that kind of courage. Um, she, um, she knew what was right. She came, you know, she had an exceptional background on the DFW board and chamber board. And um, she had held some pretty heavy duty responsibilities. So it wasn't like she didn't understand what her role was. She, she dealt with it. And she knew she had her critics. And she, uh, we had... <laughs> She once told me, she said, I know they say I'm an uppity, <laughs> N-word. And I was like, ah! and she said, I can say that, you can't. <laughs> and one time we, <laughs> I made, I cooked some collard greens <laughs> and I took them to her and she tasted them. And she said, you stick to the matzo ball soup, I'll do the collard greens. I mean, we had that kind of relationship, you know, and, and the fact that I could go to her and tell her to tell our mutual friend to shape up <laughs> and let's be friends again. Um, Cause I couldn't even get that woman's attention to tell her to her face. She was that evasive of me. And so Irma took care of it. And she knew that was the right thing too. And she knew she was caught between two friends, but she had um, guts. <laughs> she was the steel magnolia of my life. <laughs> Well, the, the fact that it really was the passing of an era and the college was in a new place, did that make it easier for the board to really have wide open eyes when they were looking for her successor? I think so. Um, we, we interviewed an interesting array of folks and I think what got Dr. Giovannini to us um, was at one point in his interview, he said something about schools and public universities in Arizona no longer receive state funds. And I am not a great numbers person, but I knew, I've known that when I first came on the board, our funding from the state of Texas was in the high 70s. And we are down less than 20 right now. So I have lived through the state diminishing our support. And I was sitting next to the headhunter who was Dr. Stephen Kinslow, who was had been president of Austin Community College and was now in the headhunting business where a lot of administrators go. And he kind of leaned over to me and he said, and you're headed that way. <laughs> <laughs> really, you're right. And Dr. Giovannini had created, got, he'd been a president of a campus for 10 or 11 years. And then he realized that the income revenue flow was not all that it could be for Maricopa. And he went to his chancellor and uh, suggested this corporate college. And pretty much what it is is a, what we now call a CIA community industry education program on steroids. And he worked, I didn't realize how many big companies are in the Phoenix area. And he had, been, he had done that for a year and sort of um, distinguished himself in that role. And when he left the room, now I'm talking out of school because this is closed session stuff, but we talked about 
who else in that crowd of people that we had met would be able to go to our business community, which is still <laughs> a pretty closed good old boy system. I'm sorry to say that's the one thing <laughs> I haven't accomplished in 30 years. But um, we needed somebody pretty strong who could speak their language and get their attention and make training available for their employees and <clears throat> create an income stream for the district. And a lot of our decision on hiring him was based on that. And I thought, <laughs> huh, silly me, I thought I was going to take him around and introduce him to the world, the Bill Thorntons of the world and the uh, bank presidents and the CEOs that I had come to know over time. And before I knew it, he was Irma Johnson on wheels out meeting and greeting and talking. And when you're with him one-on-one, -on -one, he's not... <laughs> He's difficult to, to bring out, but once you get him behind a podium or in a businessman's office, it's gangbusters. And one day, and I would try to tell him how things used to work or how we did things or here's the history on that, and, and he would just sit there. And then he'd say, I know. And finally one day I said, how do you know? He said, you don't think I didn't study you all and read all your minutes and watch all your board meetings while you were looking at me? to be, you know, the chancellor. And I thought, of course you did. And so he really has, when you look at his appointment list at the end of the agenda each month, he's meeting people I've never heard of. <laughs> but he's meeting all the right people. And he's he went with Mayor Williams to New York recently to meet some people. And, and Mayor Williams invited him to do that. So little by little, Tarrant County College, even though the Star-Telegram has neglected to list us in here, elections coming up, and the chamber still doesn't quite understand that when you go visit a business and offer them space and time and incentives here, you should take the chancellor of the community college who is getting thousands of dollars from the Texas Workforce Board in cooperation with Workforce Solutions, which is the local workforce board, which a lot of people don't even know about. But uh, at the recent chamber annual meeting, they totally ignored us in their lineup of here's what we've accomplished. And I just want to go marching into their office and say, you know what? <laughs> you do best and would do better if you would take us with you when you go hustle a business. And also Judy McDonald from the Workforce Solutions Board. She's their CEO. So we'll, we'll get it done. Maybe after I'm out of office, I can be more brassy than I am now. <laughs> Chancellor Giovannini came in and he didn't do much talking. He did a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. And then he sort of said, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. We have our three goals and we have our eight <laughs> principles, or maybe I have that backwards. And one of them is we are truly going to be one college. We had been giving that lip service forever. Mm -hmm. We are one college, and yet our campuses were very distinct and sometimes competitive, <laughs> very competitive, and sometimes very jealous yeah. of one another. Yeah. But you think, see things going on where we're gradually going that direction. I think so. Do, do you think it's time we did that? Do you think we'll yeah. succeed? Um, I don't ever want to be as divided, if you will, that's not a good word, is Dallas, where each campus is its own operation with its own staff, its own, uh, all, almost all the same org chart people it, it duplicated how many times over their district. Um, each, camp, we, each of our campuses is distinct, and there are programs that are unique to that campus, like the nursing and health sciences campus on Trinity River. We've moved a few programs. That's been a little, um, like nursing. We moved nursing from south. Mm -hmm. But once they saw the building and the equipment, mm -hmm. <laughs> they quit fussing. Culinary is out, has outgrown its space and equipment. Uh, we're looking at a lot of programs out at the new Texas Live um, campus. And we may either move culinary or take a branch of it out there so that 
those students have the experience of those hotels and restaurants out there. We've talked to the Omni. I was at a meeting at our luncheon at the Omni several years ago and I was seated next to the manager and I said something about our culinary students and he said, what culinary students? And Judith Carey was president of Southeast at the time. She was across the room and I said, I'll be right back. And I went, <laughs> I, see what I mean about being pushy? I went and got Judith. I said, I need for you to come sit next to, and I can't even remember his name now and I'm sure he's gone. And he doesn't know about our culinary program and Judith, <laughs> of course, loved that. And so we switched seats and she sat next to him. <laughs> I'm sure totally monopolized the rest of his time at the lunch table. But you, we have to make changes to accommodate our community. Irma used to say, we're not only a community college or the community college, we're the community's college. We have to respond to what the community needs in the way of education for its citizens, but also the workforce. And that's the thing. In fact, this morning, there's another article online in the business press. The consultant at the chamber meeting last uh, week said, Fort Worth has no image. They don't know what you have to offer. Your educational systems are siloed. I thought, no, they're not. We work with each other. And you're saying the same thing that another higher paid consultant said 30 years ago when I started my relocation business. People, they want to live in Dallas and work in Fort Worth. No, you don't. Come get in the car with me. <laughs> so anyway, I, I've tried to calm down about this, but after May 4th, I may have some meetings with some people. <laughs> I can, I, you know, that's the other thing I learned about being on a public board. You are always on the public board. And when you speak, if you're not careful, your comments could be attributable to the public board or the institution you represent. So you have to be really careful in responding to anyone's questions, particularly the medium. And I've had to counsel <laughs> with some of my board members over time because they're either not thinking about that. One of them told me, I've, I've been here before, I know how to handle this. There was a reporter at one of our meetings and she was going after us for something and he was dealing with her. Uh, we have professionals who will handle that. He said, I can handle this. I've, I've been in this situation before. And I, I thought, okay, I can't wait to see the headline tomorrow. <laughs> so anyway. After the board election of 2013, it was kind of a case of what comes around, goes around. And uh, you had been defeated for the presidency, four to three vote. Now you were reelected to the presidency by a four to three vote. And the switch in the vote, the siding switch, was O.K. Carter. What, how did that come about? O.K. will tell you this himself. He came on this board ultimately to get rid of Irma and me. He really did not like us or the way we were doing business. And we both knew that, Irma and I knew that. And Irma was the one who said, keep on keeping on. What we're doing is the right thing for the college he'll eventually get on board. And I said, I don't know, Irma. <laughs> so sure enough, he came on and in private and at the table, he would make comments that showed that he was critical of some of our programs, some of our projects, some of our people. And I spent some one-on-one -on -one time with him trying to uh, tell me, how would you change it? What, what changes would you make? And he really didn't have much to offer. He just didn't like the way it was. And, and I have with me to put in the archives some of his election campaign material that was sent to me. And it was totally mean, ugly, rough. Nothing like we'd ever seen before in a Tarrant County College election. So over time, and then to complicate things, his wife worked for us and she had a different name. So a lot of people didn't realize that. And um, right before the election, Irma decided, independent of the election and the fact that he was a candidate, she really was critical of the work being done by this woman. And she felt like um, any changes or firing if that if he was elected would be even more trouble than if she did it before. And so she did. And that didn't help. <laughs> so anyway, he and I, I think he came 
to maybe not like me, but trust me. And ultimately, I think he did decide I was okay. And he showed up at my little retirement reception the other day. He was the first person I saw as I walked out of the elevator and I was shocked. <laughs> and I was so grateful to Reg or whoever of y'all did the guest list that you thought to invite him and Kristen, who to me was the ultimate in board members. And I tried every way I knew besides her going to jail to keep her from leaving. But she felt like with her new job with Congressman Granger, it, the optics weren't good. So, and she was right. And so ever so often we just have coffee and girl talk. But she was there and, and for OK to make that trip from Arlington and park and get in there with a bunch of people he probably didn't know anymore, mm -hmm. that really meant a lot to me. And I felt like we had overcome a real rough patch. And he and I have exchanged emails since. And his, his messages have been reassuring mm -hmm. that um, he, he still, you know, he, <laughs> Mr. Grumpy, I used to call him, you know, he was, he was rough before he was on the board. I remember going to something at UTA and he was sitting on a couch and I knew who he was and I walked over just to say hello and he was not friendly. <laughs> He's just kind of a curmudgeon. <laughs> And yet when I see him out, I, I ran into him at a restaurant in Arlington one day and he couldn't have been nicer, so moody maybe. But I think he's come to uh, care about us and, and, and be okay with us. What will it be like next month when you do hand oh. over that gavel? To what extent will you miss this much? I will. Um, I can already tell sort of a diminishing uh, number of activities, although I'm trying to get to everything I can just to say hello and thank you to everybody. But it's been a big part of my life and I was trying to clean out the file cabinet the other day and I thought, oh, <laughs> you're gonna have trouble with this. <laughs> you have some withdrawal symptoms. But, uh, you know, it's a six year term and I'll be 80 in October. And I know Dr. Owen lasted till she was 96, but <laughs> um, and Gordon and I are both in good health, thankfully, and hopefully we will continue to be. But um, already I can see he, he wants to go to this legal conference in May in Boston, I mean in DC. And then he's, we're treating the grandchildren in Dallas to a trip to Boston to see all the historical places in the summer. And I'm looking to see, is that a, a third Thursday? And I don't, I don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'll miss is all of these folks. And you and I have kept in touch. You didn't stay away very well either. No, I didn't. <laughs> Thankfully, because you're remembering more about me than I do. But um, it'll be different. And hopefully uh, my preferred candidate will be in place. And he certainly knows something about governance and public meetings and dealing with the public and making wise decisions. His father was uh, mayor pro tem while the community college, junior college was being considered. And then he was mayor for several years. So Ken is very familiar and understands the importance. It was fed to him at the dinner table. The other thing he's, as after he sold the printing company, he's gone into consulting and he's, because of his political savvy and his business connections, <clears throat> excuse me, he's been helping companies and colleges, including us, with some decision making. And we will likely float a bond issue in the fall. And I said, <coughs> excuse me, the one thing I don't want the public to think that I'm leaving because I don't approve of the bond issue. So I hope somehow they'll involve me in the bond issue uh, campaign so that I can continue advocating for the college and its facility needs is pretty much what that will be about. Since you announced your retirement from the board, uh, <coughs> you've been consistently asked to name your, uh, your greatest achievements. You have always deferred and say, I want to talk about the college's achievements yeah. and, and the addition of campuses, the growth in enrollment and, and success and all of that. But what about you? What things do you look back on and, and say, even if you don't say it out loud, even if you don't want to say it, that I was really 
a driving factor in making that happen. And it was good for Tarrant County and it was good for our students. Well, it's the new campuses. I think it's excellent faculty, even though I don't have a direct hand in that. Um, we uh, meet those people at the board meetings and I know that the chancellor, whoever he or she is, knows that we expect a high standard of resume and performance and ultimately that decision is the only person we hire and fire, of course, is the chancellor. So he or she knows if they don't get it right, <laughs> we might have issues with them. But And, and I think the involvement of, of programs like the Early College High School and dual enrollment and the TABS program and um, the nursing and health sciences programs on Trinity River are just unbelievable. And when I left nursing, the EKG machine was just coming into <laughs> being. And I found a picture going through some of my stuff the other day. The Star Telegram has a picture of me in my white cap and my white uniform. And I was director of in-service education at All Saints. And I'm showing these two nurses this new wonderful machine that can monitor your heart. <laughs> <laughs> that is the ultimate <laughs> in achievement that, and when I thought I would go back to nursing, I knew I would have to almost go back to school because after 18 years of raising kids and getting them off to college, the technology had just passed me by and I was a menace to the industry. So um, we, you know, we all bring um, different achievements <laughs> to the grave with us. And I think um, making friends with the people here um, and being a part of the growth of the college and its programs and its offerings to the community. We have people teaching classes, I think, in 11 other sites in addition to our five land campuses and our six online. We are all over the place. And 100,000 people a year are taking advantage of what we have to offer. That's a whole lot of people. And to be a part of that is, is a point of pride to me. So fast forward to 2065. It's going to be the centennial of oh. Tarrant County College. Uh, I don't think You'll either one of us will- You'll find me in the will, time capsule. <laughs> we, we won't be around. But somebody is going to do a retrospective yeah. and they're gonna talk about the board presidents of Tarrant County College. What do you want them to say about you? Mm. <laughs> She gave it her best. She cared. Um, she left it a better place. All the <laughs> trite things that you would hope would be part of your obituary <laughs> or your <laughs> eulogy. Um, there, I made mistakes. There were judgment calls that probably could have been better. But I have to move beyond those and look at the overall <clears throat> ending. And I've been lucky with the the board members I've worked with, particularly this group now, they are as engaged as any board I've ever worked with at any level, whether it's in the nonprofit sector or other schools. I was part of my children's uh, private school for a number of years. Um, and I, I sat on a, a advisory board for a bank and for a utility company and you talk about just letting the professionals do their work. <clears throat> and one bank, one, actually I sat on two, one bank board for real and one is kind of a community advisor. And when the real bank board um, founder and funder came to me and said, we need to um, infuse this bank with several hundred thousand more dollars because it's it was during bank failure time. And I said, well, I'll have to talk to Gordon about that, but probably we're not going to do that. He said, you can't talk to Gordon about it. And I said, uh, I don't have that kind of money in my grocery account. I think I'll be leaving. So, you know, you encounter all sorts of different operations, but I know that whatever goes on here is being live streamed and being recorded somehow. And... Um, it's honest, and these people care. They really do. Um, I don't think there's anyone on the board right now who is critical or negative about anything we're doing. They're looking for better ways, perhaps, or asking questions about could that be done differently. 
but but they're they're on the team and and I'm pleased that I've been part of it. Well, in 2065, there will be somebody else who will be president of the Tarrant County College Board of Trustees. And if you could walk through the door like Marley's ghost after midnight <laughs> and say, I want to give you a piece of advice, what would it be? Um, keep it real. Don't take yourself too seriously, but take the work seriously. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap this thing up? I'm just flattered that you all care enough to hear me chatter on. <laughs> and um, I did not want to do this, just like I didn't want the party the other night. <laughs> but I'm glad I came, and I'm glad you asked. And maybe it would be fun someday for someone to watch.